Before I start, do hit that subscribe button. It really helps with the channel recommendation on YouTube. I remember this being back in 2012. I was on patrol along the Mississippi River just outside of St. Louis. The area I was patrolling is considered one of the most haunted areas in all the United States. We get a lot of reports from people who see things like ghosts and whatnot. So at about 4 a.m., dispatch received a call from a frantic lady who was talking about seeing a man with glowing red eyes and huge fangs coming out of the woods towards her house. Now, this woman specifically was known to be on medications that caused paranoia and schizophrenia. So we initially thought it might have been some kind of hallucination brought on by her medication. But she sounded panicked, telling us there might actually be something going on. And so we had to check it out. We arrived at the area she called from, a lone gravel road leading to an old farmhouse. As we got closer, I began getting this odd feeling like something bad was about to happen. When we got up to the house, you could see something or somebody appearing to be huddled behind an old tree stump near some bushes. But since it was dark, you couldn't make out who or what it was until we got close. As we got close enough, I could finally see who, or rather what, it was. At first, all I saw were two green eyes staring back at me with an expression that seemed like terror. I couldn't exactly tell what it was, other than it wasn't human but looked like some sort of ape or monkey. That's when it stood up, and it was easily nine feet tall, looking like this thing could have attacked somebody and destroyed us. Its long brown hair kind of flung off its body, and it had pointed ears on top of its head. But what really caught me off guard, initially hiding behind the stump, was its long snout and large fangs. I thought this might have been some sort of rabid bay or something, but I had never been filled with so much terror before in my life. This thing jumps up in the tree instantly and then leaps back toward us in a pouncing motion, swiping one of its claws. A second one of these creatures steps out of the woods right by where the first one attacked and begins to run towards us. My partner and I fire a couple of shots as these things give chase, and we quickly dart back to our vehicle. They all dart off back into the swamps. We had to go get back up, and we realized that this situation wasn't safe. This was not the last time that we encountered what we like to call the Wolves of the Everglades. In fact, there's a much longer version, which I'll probably share with you in a separate email. But for now, I don't think these creatures are innocent. I believe that this woman was not just on her medication. These things were truly trying to break into her house and who knows what they would have done to her. How they got in remains a mystery. This happened in 1982 years ago. I had a girlfriend who had been killed in a car accident by a drunk driver. She had gotten in the accident on August 18th, and on August 20th she had been pronounced dead, two months before her 20th birthday. On Halloween night, there was a party at the house where she had lived. Her roommates had decided to have a party to try and get over the grieving process and whatnot. We had hired a band from over in Everett, Washington, and I was over at the house to let the band in. The band that came, none of them knew about Lisa's death, and the head singer for the band had gone into the bathroom back by Lisa's bedroom. It was a female with dark hair. Lisa had red hair. She was in the bathroom combing her hair, and she let out a scream like I had never heard before in my life. I went running back there, and she was standing there in the mirror, just as white as could be. And she looked at me, and she said, Someone has died here. And I said, What do you mean? And she said, I looked into the mirror, and it wasn't my face. She described Lisa right to a T. She walked out of the bathroom, and she turned and looked right at Lisa's room, and she said, that's her room. Well, the first thing I thought was that these people were trying to play a really sick joke. I got together with a couple other people and we were talking about it, and this girl from the band kept wanting to leave. And before she had gone into the bathroom, she had been so excited about playing this gig. 
Later in the evening, I was standing in Lisa's bedroom talking to somebody and I looked out the window and I saw her reflection from behind me and heard her voice asking me to leave. I left the party and later that night over $10,000 damage was done to that house by people getting out of hand. Sitting here recalling it, I get the shakes like I did that night. I really believe that she had come back not wanting people sitting there getting drunk and wrecking the house. General Harrison's solemn voice echoed through the television speakers as he addressed the nation. His military uniform and stern expression conveyed a sense of urgency and gravity. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow citizens, he began, I stand before you today not as a soldier, but as a concerned citizen. The Secret Service, in collaboration with other government agencies, has uncovered undeniable proof that our national forests and parks are now infested by unknown predators. I implore you all to exercise extreme caution and vigilance when visiting these areas. Stay safe and report any unusual sightings or encounters to the authorities. The General's message sent ripples of unease through the country. People began to speculate about what kind of creatures could have infiltrated the pristine wilderness of their beloved national parks. While some dismissed it as a hoax, others heeded the warning and canceled their camping and hiking plans. Among the cautious was myself, a seasoned hiker with a penchant for exploring the wilds of Yosemite National Park. The temptation of the untouched wilderness proved too strong and I decided to undertake a solo hike on one of Yosemite's more popular trails. The sun bathed the forest in a gentle, golden light as I ventured deeper into the wilderness. The scent of pine and earth filled the air, a soothing balm to my senses. The hike was uneventful until I began to detect an ominous odor, a foul stench of decay that hung in the air like a sinister omen. Unable to resist my curiosity, I followed the pungent trail of the rancid odor, straying from the beaten path. My heart pounded in my chest as I ventured further into the undergrowth. The scent grew stronger, and my instincts warned me that something was terribly wrong. Emerging into a small clearing, my eyes widened with disbelief, and my heart threatened to escape my chest. There, before me, stood an unknown predator, a creature unlike anything I had ever seen or heard of before. It was massive, easily towering at eight feet in height, its body covered in dark gray fur with streaks of brown, giving it a menacing appearance. Its mane, reminiscent of a male lion's, framed its elongated face, and its eyes gleamed with an eerie intelligence. This enigmatic beast walked upright on its back legs, a bizarre sight that defied nature's laws. Paralyzed by fear and fascination, I watched as it transitioned to all fours and bolted away at an unimaginable speed, disappearing into the forest. I knew I should have retreated, but an inexplicable urge to understand this cryptid overcame me. Slowly, I advanced, hoping to get a closer look. The creature must have sensed my approach, for it suddenly stopped and turned toward me. It unleashed a deafening roar, a primal sound that reverberated through the forest. Terror surged through me like an electric shock, and I turned and sprinted back in the direction I had come from, my breath ragged and panicked. I ran for what felt like an eternity, my heart racing, my mind consumed by fear. After what seemed like an eternity, I glanced over my shoulder and realized that the creature was no longer pursuing me. Exhausted and trembling, I finally came to a halt, my legs threatening to give way beneath me. My mind was a whirlwind of confusion, and I struggled to comprehend the reality of what I had just witnessed. What was that creature, and how had it come to inhabit Yosemite's wilds? As I sat there, gasping for breath, a profound sense of unease washed over me. General Harrison's warning echoed in my mind, and I couldn't help but wonder if my encounter was part of a larger, unsettling phenomenon. The unknown predators had become a chilling reality, and the secrets of the wilderness held mysteries far more terrifying than I could have ever imagined.
The drive through this part of Nevada was beautiful. The tall cliffs were lined by majestic pines while the road leisurely wound through the scenery. But no matter how amazing the view was, it couldn't change the fact that I was out here to deal with something incredibly unpleasant. My brother Jason worked as a park ranger until he suddenly went missing one night. No one knows exactly what happened. From all appearances, he seemed to have gotten up from the ranger station to check on something routine and never came back. There was an extensive search, but nothing turned up. The ranger station had been found exactly as it should be. There were no signs of a struggle, no strange tire tracks or footprints leading away from the park, and no eyewitnesses who reported seeing Jason anywhere after that. So here I was, trying to do what everyone in my family wanted me to do and see if I could find anything. Was I optimistic? Not really. But stranger things have happened in life. All I knew was that I was here to look around, and that was what I was going to do. It was late afternoon by the time I arrived at my destination. The town the park was located by was as average as could be. A main street lined with a variety of shops and stores, and residential areas that branched off it. A place you've seen on a thousand brochures and postcards. I parked in front of the local pizza restaurant. Not only was I hungry, this would be a great opportunity to see what people around here were like. If they were open and welcoming, especially if I mentioned my brother, I'd know what I was dealing with. If not, that meant something was up, and I would get out of there as quickly as possible. The pizza place had a few customers this time of day, so I got right in at a table in the middle of the restaurant. I decided on a medium pepperoni pizza and relaxed in my seat while sipping my water. Once I was done eating my pizza, which was very good, I paid the bill and left a generous tip and headed to the park my brother had worked at for two years until he vanished one night. The park looked like any other I'd seen. Well maintained, neat, and orderly. The kind of place you'd like to have a picnic in. But of course, nature is like anything else. What you see on the surface is only a fraction of what is really going on. I drove up the neatly landscaped driveway and parked in front of the ranger station. My shoes crunched on the gravel as I got out of the car and approached the building. I was expecting an old rustic cabin, but this ranger station was relatively modern, with large bay windows and a gleaming metal facade. I approached the front door, knocked, and waited. A moment later, it opened and a man in a ranger uniform looked at me. How can I help you? he asked. I'm Alex, Jason's brother. I'm here for some information. Oh, I see. Come right in. The ranger held the door open and pointed to a sitting area. I'll let the boss know you're here. Can I get you something to drink? I'm fine, thank you. All right. We'll be right with you. And with that, the ranger hustled down the hallway and I was left alone. I hadn't given anyone a heads up I was coming. I didn't want anyone to prepare for my arrival. My brother had gone missing several weeks ago. It was just a question of why. I don't believe he just ran off for no reason, so that meant there had to be a reason why. And everyone, me included, wanted to know what that was. Since he went missing at work, it seemed obvious to be work-related, but it was entirely possible that it was connected to something else. It could have been something he encountered while at work, but had nothing to do with the job itself. Personally, I've never been a huge fan of camping or anything like that. I certainly appreciate nature, but I'm definitely more of the stay inside and read a book type. Jason was always much more enthusiastic about the outdoors, and it wasn't a surprise to anyone when he became a park ranger. Just like it was no surprise to anyone when I became an architect. And here we were. At that moment, an older man who was also in a ranger uniform came out and faced me. Alex? Yes. I'm Tim, park manager. He shook my hand firmly. Nice to meet you, I said. Likewise. Jason was a good ranger and we all liked him. So if I can be of any help, don't hesitate to ask. I appreciate that. And what I need now is information. Tim nodded. 
Of course. Why don't you follow me to my office? He led the way to his office, a small room with a neat view of the park entrance. Once I sat down in a chair facing his desk, and he leaned back in his desk chair, we started talking again. I would love to say we have new information for you, but we don't, and it bothers me. We've never had an incident like this in the history of this park. I see. The only other thing I can think to add is that about a week or so after he vanished, I was out on my route checking on things, and I could feel someone watching me. Just for a moment, but it was there. And I had no idea who was responsible. Because when I looked around, I didn't see anyone. Interesting. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Not at all. What do you think happened to your brother? I've thought about that a million times. The honest answer is I don't know. But I don't believe he just ran off. That isn't Jason. That's fair. And for what it's worth, I don't believe it either. All right. Now it's my turn to ask you something. What are the odds that something happened to Jason out here? Tim paused as he considered my question. Somewhat possible. I've always liked working here, but the woods are the woods, and things happen out there. No doubt. Okay, the next logical step is to think that if something happened in the woods, where exactly was it most likely? Are there any locations around here something odd tends to happen at? Places people tend to steer clear of if they can avoid it. It doesn't have to be in the park, but around town. Tim chuckled. Oh, that would be the old quarry. No doubt about it. Or more exactly, what's left of the old quarry? You know mining used to be the big industry out here? I do. What's happened at the old quarry? That I know of. The usual things people would prefer to forget. And that's just what we know of. Can you point me towards it? Tim stood up from his desk. I can do better than that. I can show you where it is. Great. Tim led the way in his truck, and we were there in 15 minutes. We parked on a small cliff overlooking the quarry itself, which was now filled with water. A group of five people were sitting further down on the cliff, and they glanced at the two of us with slight interest when they saw our cars pull up. When we got out of our vehicles, we briefly glanced at each other, and Tim gave me a slight nod of encouragement. Then I stepped forward. I'm looking for some information. My brother's gone missing. He was a park ranger. If you can help, you'll be compensated for it. Then I took out my phone, pulled up a picture of Jason, and held it up so they could see it. The group all looked at the photo for a second. After a moment, I saw one of the guys do a double take. I've seen him, the guy nodded, less than a month ago. I got chills as he said this, because that would be right about the time Jason went missing. Where was he? The Wistful Pines Inn. It's a hotel about an hour away, Tim said. What was he doing? Nothing in particular, just hanging around near the road from what I could tell. But from the look in his eyes, he seemed very focused on something. Thank you for your help. I reached in my pocket and gave him a $100 bill. Then Tim and I headed for the Wistful Pines Inn. It was your typical roadside motel with two stories and a swimming pool in front. There was also a small sign advertising where the front office was, so I headed there while Tim stayed in his truck. Standing at the front desk was an older woman with long silver hair. Hello, how can I help you? She asked politely. My brother went missing in the area about a month ago, and I was wondering if maybe you'd seen him here. Then I showed her the photo. There were no signs she'd ever seen him before. No, I'm sorry. I don't recall seeing him here. I put my phone away. Thank you. But that doesn't mean he wasn't here. Just that I didn't see him. What was his name? I gave her Jason's full name, and she deftly typed it into the computer in front of her and paused for a moment. Nope. Nothing in our records either. We don't have security cameras, so there's nothing to check there, I'm afraid. I really appreciate your help. It was a long shot anyways. 
A tip. She nodded. I see. Well, your tip may be right after all, because strictly between us. Her voice lowered a bit. A film crew was staying here for about a week while they were in the area to film part of a documentary. They haven't been seen since the night before last. The idea settled in the air uneasily as she pressed a few buttons on the computer before turning the screen so I could see it. On it was a local news article about the film crew who was in town to do a piece about abandoned mines. The film crew all looked to be close to me in age, and by all appearances they seemed happy and content. Thanks for telling me. Sure. I have no idea what happened, but good luck with finding your brother. Come back if you need anything else. Thank you. Then I left the office and told Tim what I found out. He sat there quietly for a moment before he started talking. We've dealt with a lot of people wanting to get footage of this or that over the years. It's amazing, really. How nature can be dangerous enough when you know what you're doing and have tons of experience. No doubt. Is it possible that they disappeared not just because they were filming, but because of what they were filming, Tim considered it for a moment. Absolutely. Just a thought. No, I get it. It's a valid question. We have no idea what they were filming, but we can always double check. It's certainly possible that they were filming something completely routine and stumbled onto something they didn't intend to. I shivered slightly at the thought. One person going missing could have many explanations. Two going missing doesn't have as many possibilities, but a number of scenarios could have happened depending on the circumstances. But a group, that's inherently unsettling because it strongly suggests something bad happened. But with nothing left to go on, I had no choice but to call it a day. Especially since I had actually accomplished something since I got here. So I grabbed some dinner at a local diner and planned to go back to my hotel room. I had just gotten in my car when there was a knock on the driver's side window. My jaw dropped when I looked up and saw Jason. He was dressed casually in clothes that looked a little beat up, but there was no mistaking my brother. I immediately opened the door and climbed out of the car so I could take a good look at Jason. His clothes were worn, he'd been spending a lot of time outdoors, and he looked a little gaunt, but it was him. I never thought I'd ever see Jason again. I thought he was lost forever, so I was ecstatic to see him. I could barely believe this was happening. Good to see you, Alex, he said nonchalantly as if our meeting was the most routine thing in the world. What is going on here? I failed to keep the shock out of my voice. I ran. From what? Them. The simplicity of the response was chilling. It said so little and so much at the same time. Them, I asked. Let's just say I was out in the woods, and it turns out I wasn't alone. I barely got away. The film crew that vanished? I don't know anything about that, but it doesn't surprise me. We need to get out of here, right now. From the look in his eyes, I knew Jason was seriously afraid of something. And since I'd accomplished what I set out to do here, I had no reason or desire to stay. So I got back in the car, he hopped in beside me and I pulled out of the parking lot. How did you know I was here? I asked him once we were heading down the road. I've seen you around town. Where should we go? Away from here. Got it. Can I ask why? Of course. While working at the park, I'd heard rumors of the area's past. By now, I'm sure you know it used to be a prosperous mining area a few decades ago. Or at least it was until there was a nasty accident that resulted in the mining company closing down after a bunch of people died in the mine after there was a cave-in. I heard rumors that there were a few people that survived the accident, but never came out of the mine and vanished into the hills. I'd always considered it just a campfire story until one night a few weeks ago. A group of people came out of nowhere, chased me into a cave, and I thought I'd never get out. When I was finally able to escape, I was in the middle of nowhere and had to use my outdoors experience to find my way back here. Especially since I had no idea how many were out there or if I was being followed. 
That was why everyone thought I'd disappeared. If anyone could make it through that, it would be you. Appreciate it. The road we were on had narrowed down to one lane, and I was acutely aware that we were surrounded by tall trees on this stretch of road. But when the road turned and I saw the road was blocked by a massive fallen tree, my stomach clenched, and I felt my blood freeze in my veins. I quickly tried to back up, but when I did, I felt the tires run over something and I knew they would be flat in no time at all. I didn't dare get out of the car. That was what whoever was behind this wanted. So I took a deep breath and looked outside. Darkness had settled on the area, and there were only a few streetlights illuminating the road out here. But even that was enough light for me to see some shadows moving at the far end of the road by the woods coming slowly towards us. The sight made me grip the steering wheel so hard my knuckles turned white. What do we do? I managed to ask Jason. Stay calm. They want us to panic. Before he could say another word, headlights blazed to life out of a cluster of trees to our right, and I thought for sure the vehicle they belonged to was going to crash straight into us. But I watched as the vehicle in question, a small RV, roared past us, parked alongside us on the curb and the driver's side window rolled down. I got another shock when I realized it was one of the members of the missing film crew. Get in, she yelled to us. She didn't need to tell us twice. Jason and I immediately got out of my rental car and ran to the RV's door and climbed inside. Once Jason slammed the door shut, the driver immediately took off and we were out of there. As I tried to catch my breath, I found myself face to face with the rest of the film crew, who were sitting comfortably around the RV's interior. Thanks, I said once I'd sat down on the floor. No problem, a woman with curly blonde hair who was sitting in an armchair said. We'd been watching what they were up to for hours. We knew they were up to something. We were just waiting for them to act so we could do something about it. Is that why no one's seen you guys for a while? Jason asked. A guy sitting on the couch nodded. Yes, we'd stumbled upon them while researching a different abandoned mine, and it became the subject of our footage. Are you that park ranger who went missing? Uh-huh, Jason said. I stumbled across them too. Jason and the film crew talked for the rest of the drive until we eventually made our way back to town and went straight to the police. After we explained what happened and the film crew showed them the footage they had, the police went out to where my rental car had been left on the road. It was just as we'd left it. They searched the area thoroughly, and nothing ever turned up. But at least now everyone knows to be alert, and that's something. After that, Jason came home, and everyone was beyond stunned by what happened. No one was surprised when he took another park ranger job, but this time much closer to home. The documentary the crew had been working on was eventually released and won some awards. Jason and I even went along to a few showings to talk to the audience. It was definitely a unique experience. I live in East Central Louisiana in Washington Parish. For the past few months, I have been seeing a number of lights moving above my house. At first, I thought the lights were drones. I noticed after watching them night after night, they didn't move like drones I've ever flown. I got binoculars and a spotting scope and noticed a central white RGB type light in a V pattern small craft. I considered it to most likely be an alien drone or possibly a military drone. Possible since I'm so close to an airport. Well, I decided one night to go outside and signal the small crafts with a flashlight. I've heard math is the universal language, so I flashed a couple sequences of prime numbers. I told my wife to come outside quick. I could see a large ship approaching from a few houses down nearly grazing the treetops. Turning and redirecting itself towards my backyard like it already knew my GPS location. I looked in amazement followed by shock and fear. It passed slowly like it was looking for a place to land. The backyard is too small and too many trees around. 
but it passed so close I could have thrown a baseball and hit it. It slowly passed my yard and went over the neighbor's yard, and I couldn't see it anymore after. I looked up and saw about ten same types of ships flying fast high in the sky in a sequence. Then I noticed smoke everywhere. Like my neighbor's house was burning down. Smelled like gunpowder. I looked for the source of the smoke. I believe the ship popped off smoke before it was going to try and land one street over. I realized I would have had a heart attack if it had landed. To describe them. Large square bronze looking metal. White lights around the sides. Circle pattern red flashing lights on the bottom. My wife says she had a hard time with the glare of white lights and couldn't give a definite description. The next afternoon we were all outside and hundreds of them were in the sky. I could hear the neighbor's kids making jokes about an invasion. I saw people looking up and down the street. I called my mom and told her. She said I need help. I started to film one as it got dark. My wife and I are sitting in chairs in the middle of our lawn. One is flying over and I'm recording. The next morning before work I decided to watch the video. As usual, when I record a UFO the video isn't what was thought to be recorded. To sum it up, I recorded a UFO landing a few feet from me and a little alien next to it. Looking right at me. Now the repercussions of this lasted three or four days. Dark entities manifested in a bunch of my photos on my phone, my wife's phone. Even pictures in other unrelated clouds. Needless to say, I had to delete a lot of pictures. Alien photo editors. Please explain the physics behind that one. We were visiting friends in Maine, and they lived not far from the Appalachian Trail and a group of colonial-era cellar holes. Being a history buff, we packed lunches and headed up to the cellar holes with a metal detector. It wasn't entirely legal, but it's not like the cops were hiding behind trees. We found some cool pewter buttons, square nails, interesting shards of fine pottery, and unidentifiable chunks of iron. After enjoying our lunch, we wandered around, and then someone suggested that we climb a nearby hill to watch the sunset, which was a glorious sight. We, a group of friends reminiscing about our college days, were laughing and passing around a bottle of wine. As the purple shadows crept up the hill, only the very top where we were seated still had some light. Suddenly, we realized that we would be descending into darkness, so we gathered everything up. Luckily, my friend had one of those headband flashlights a bit dorky, but it came in handy. He took the lead as we made our way down, with plenty of wine-fueled slips and laughs. We descended into a dense cover of pines, and there were two huge boulders marking each side of the trail, each the size of a full-size car standing upright. My wife suddenly giggled and said, Carl, disapprovingly. I asked, What? And she claimed, You grabbed my ass, and you know you did. I denied it and instead held her close, awkwardly half-running as I pushed past my friend and his wife. They were bewildered by the situation but caught our fear and hurried after us. About twenty yards down the trail, my friend turned his flashlight back up the trail, revealing some red cloth along the edge of one of the big rocks, resembling the edge of a shirt. My friend yelled something, and the tiny sliver of cloth disappeared around the rock. We stood there, breathing heavily, watching the circle of light panning back and forth on the rock. We stood there for what felt like a long time, not seeing or hearing anything. Tom said he'd keep the light on whatever it was, and I should guide the women back down the hill. We did so, and I kept looking back toward Tom, who remained still and silent. Finally, as we emerged from the trees and entered a field, he came running down the path, his flashlight bobbing all over the place. He reported that he never saw anything but had heard a metal scraping sound before he started running. Lived in Yellowstone for a summer. Took a nice hike x 15-18 miles. Got back to car. 
5% cell battery left. Car battery was totally dead. Sun is set and getting darker by the minute, around 9.30 p.m. No cell service at the car in the trailhead parking area. So exhausted, hike the half mile back down the dirt access road to the paved road. Walk to the top of the closest hill, another half mile. Flitter one single bar, call. Get park service, call drops. Happens twice more, 2%. Finally get through and talk to dispatch. She sends the wrecker my way, but that the wrecker was in West Yellowstone at the time doing another call. Will get to me in perhaps one hours. Says the ranger ought to be by in a bit to secure the parking area for the night. Thank her and hike back down the paved road. Then turn and hike past the hills and draws and curves down the dirt road to the campground. Get to car, very last bit of light fading into very dark night. Clear but low, no moon. In Yellowstone, so pretty dark. I settle in for the wait. A few minutes pass and I figure I'd better let the wrecker know which car in the lot was mine for whenever they got there so they'd know which car needed help. There were about 15 or so in the lot, but no one was coming, going from them. Just cars of folks who were out in the backcountry for another day. Totally dark after a few more minutes. See a set of headlights round the curve into the lot. Figure it's the ranger. Tell him howdy, explain the situation to him. He radios and confirms W dispatch that the wrecker is coming. They affirm, about another hour or so. He lets me know he has other areas to secure, but will return in a couple hours to make sure I got out of there okay. I thank him and he drives off. About another half hour goes by. I'm sitting in the driver's seat, hood up, but can still see the entryway to the lot. I hear the gravel crunching and see lights approaching of another vehicle. Weird. No one should be arriving yet, and it's not as though anyone is coming to the area tonight hike. It's Yellowstone. That's dangerous. I'm sure folks do it, but... The truck comes into view. It is driving basically without pressure on the gas, just rolling forward. About three miles per hour. Slower than is courteous, creepy slow. It makes the loop around the lot, and as it pulls in its lights cast over my car, hood up. F. There was no way that the truck didn't see me, notice my hood. The lights finish the sweep of the lot and the truck crawls over to the far side of the row of cars I've parked in. The truck backs into the spot. I expect the lights to go off and begin to dread the inevitable interaction, whatever it might be. I remember a friend of mine had told me, if ever in a bad spot, be assertive. Because I'm normally pretty much a people pleaser, helper. I emotionally strap in and prepare myself. The truck lights never shut off and suddenly the truck roars forward, about 15 feet out into the gravel, then slowly creeps back into the space. Weird. The truck begins to repeat this. I'm on edge. It's really noisy and there is no reason to do that at all. I begin to check my mirrors, unsure if the truck is trying to distract me while someone else approaches. It's so dark out. It's very hard for my eyes to adjust from looking at the truck with its lights on to the mirrors. The truck continues this erratic revving and backing for 10 or so minutes. Finally, the lights shut off and the engine turns off. Here we go. A man slowly approaches along the front of the row of cars. My eyes are still darting to each mirror, checking, checking. He is about 20 or so feet in front of the line of vehicles walking towards the display map and trailhead marker to my left. My cell phone has totally died. His walk is a very slow stroll. As he draws near and finally is in front of me, I'm assertive. My heart is pounding, but I press myself and commit. I swing my door open and greet him with, Howdy. Have you got a jump? He pauses. What? His voice is strangely high and blushy. Almost like, like Mickey or something. Just oddly high. His stature is six, perhaps 220. Mid-aged, I can make out the silhouette of jeans, cowboy hat, plaid collar shirt. Normal attire for that area. But anyone from that area definitely knows that pulling into odd trihead parking areas in Yellowstone at 10 p.m. is just something that no one does. 
so extra weird. I feel like he is familiar enough with the local culture to know that he shouldn't be there. I repeat exactly what I said, a bit more directly in tone, and add, Jumper cables, have you got any? My battery's dead. He doesn't answer my question, but instead, he asks, after a long pause, Do you have help coming? I panic inside. I'm panicking inside. My heart is pounding. I deliberately inflect a happy casualness into my tone and reply. Oh yeah, actually you just missed the ranger on his way out lie. It had been 30 minutes and the wrecker is due here any minute, but I'm trying to avoid the $200 lie. Wrecker still another half hour away at least. The guy paused for a moment and said he didn't have any jumpers. He continued to walk then, along the front line of cars, to my left, arriving at the trailhead and map perhaps 25 of them to my left. I can still barely see him, mostly just able to see the movement of his silhouette. He stands there, in the dark, at the map, for perhaps five minutes, which is lunacy because he has no light with him, and it is way too dark to see a damned thing except outlines of mountains and stars. There's literally nothing to see at the map, nothing. He just stands there, I just stand there by my car, watching him. I'm standing behind my front driver door, still occasionally glancing around for anyone else behind me. After a few long minutes, he turns back and strolls towards me again in front of the cars. He draws closer to me in my car and says, You sure you have help common, F? I grit and throw my voice out at him. Yeah, they should be here any minute. He turns square to me and takes a step or two slowly towards me, closing the distance from about 20 feet to 10 in front of me. He again asks if I'm sure. As he steps towards me, I hear be assertive. In my head from my friend and I step from behind my door and transfer my bear spray canister with the glow and the dark safety dangling off of it, visible, aimed at him in my left hand, and don't reveal my right hand, letting him consider. I'm sure. I say. The next words are just in the bottom of my throat, and are just a hair away, and I ready myself to say the words, take one more step towards me and ill spray your ass. But he stops and looks at me, and I stay very quiet and still, staring at him. He stays in a stance, facing me. It's very quiet. Moments pass. He just says, okay, and turns and slowly strolls back towards his truck. He turns his truck on and his truck repeats the series of odd revving and pulling out and slowly crawling back in about 10 more minutes. Then, finally, he slowly crawls out of the lot, gravel popping around the draws, fading into the blackness. I still am not convinced that I'm alone and I still am afraid that someone else was with him. I am also terrified that he will ditch his truck beyond the curves and then make his way back on foot. I grab my day pack and steady my nerves and make a mad dash away from my car, locking it and dashing across the lot to a long horse trailer, hiding behind it, waiting 15 minutes or so. Yellowstone is not the best place to just chill outside, though it gets cold. Moreover, uh, there are things that might eat you if you accidentally spook them, or because you are meaty and it's nighttime. Fifteen more minutes pass and lights become visible down the parking lot road. My heart is still racing and goes into overdrive. It's the wrecker. Relief floods me and I begin to shake and almost cry. I explain how glad I am to see the wrecker to wrecker guy. He just thinks I'm a dumb girl afraid of the dark and swipes my card and jumps my car. I drive back to the cabin for an hour and a half, am exhausted, and sleep. My fiancé and I love camping and always do stuff in the outdoors. We're usually pretty avid hikers and explorers. We've gone through many different trails, hikes, and many adventures out in the woods. I have never noticed anything out of the ordinary or even at a place, although I am a firm believer in the paranormal and Bigfoot and other weird occurrences that do happen, although I've never really experienced them until this particular event that I'm about to talk to you about. Me and my fiancé decided to camp at one of our favorite lakes, Lake Dewey in Michigan. 
We've camped here several times before and have always had a great experience. So this time would be no different, or so we thought. It was later September, and I remember because it was still pretty warm, but the cold crisp in the air of fall had not yet set in. We had a pretty typical fun day on the lake. We hung out, we hiked. We hung out in our tents before going back out and hiking again, and then coming back for dinner to relax for the evening. But by the end of the first night, my boyfriend was acting strange. He was getting really quiet and not talking as much as he normally does, which I just chalked it up to him being exhausted since we did have a long day. We ended up putting on the fire and turning in for the night. I noticed he seemed on edge and had a rough time falling asleep, but he didn't mention anything even when I asked him if he was okay. I sacked right out and woke up the next morning, no problems, feeling well rested and ready to take on the next day. Him, not so much. He didn't look so good and seemed like he was still on edge from yesterday. After getting up and eating breakfast and going on the next hike, the day seemed pretty normal and we decided to get ready to go back to camp as it was starting to become later in the afternoon. That's when he sat me down and told me that he had been feeling uncomfortable since yesterday. When I asked him what was wrong, he just said he didn't feel right about where we were, and then he felt like we were being looked at and watched very closely. I assured him that he was just paranoid, and it was silly to think like that. Nothing was out here. Nothing was going to get us. I convinced him to stay with me another night, but he seemed so apprehensive about it now. It was bothering me how weird he was acting because it's not like him. Usually, he's one of those guys that is the first to come up with crazy hiking trails and spots for us to check out. He was always the first one of us to want to explore dangerous territory and stuff that was never meant to be explored. This night was a little calmer and I feel like we both checked in a little earlier than normal. I ended up staying up and digging around on my cell phone, while my boyfriend just laid there trying to fall asleep. The evening had been pretty dead. We hadn't really talked a whole lot after heading back to camp. It was just kind of blah. After he sat me down and told me what he did earlier, I had been kind of on edge, but just tried to play it off. It was pretty late at night, if I remember right. I want to say my phone said something like 11.30, and this is where we started to hear footsteps go through our campsite, and I mean heavy footsteps, and then the breathing started. I started to feel really uneasy, and I just kept hearing a thud for every step that was taken. I started to panic because I wasn't sure if this was a bear we were dealing with or someone who was trying to hurt us. I looked over to my boyfriend and asked him if he heard what I was hearing and he was already as white as a ghost and nodded right at me. I sat there scared, looking at the door of my tent, trying to listen for any sound I could. The sound had ceased for a while, and all I heard was the night air. The stomping would stop for a couple of moments, and then it would resume. Whatever it was was stomping around in our camp around our tent, but it wasn't really getting into any of our stuff like a bear would. It's like it was casing our tent or something. It made me feel so nervous. Whatever it was kept getting really close to the tent, and we could hear it breathing heavily. It must have been huge because it sounded like it was a ten-foot-tall man. Either that, or it was a bison on two legs walking around our campsite. For the next few hours, this would go on and off until roughly three or four in the morning, and we could finally fall asleep. We didn't even notice the noises stopping, and the feeling of dread went away. I think my boyfriend and I fell asleep from just sheer exhaustion and panic. We still do not talk about it to this day, and when we got up the next morning, we didn't even speak. We just booked it out of there and packed up as quickly as we could. Could it have been a Bigfoot from what we saw or heard? Probably could it have been someone rummaging through our camp. I don't know. Whatever it was, I don't think I'll ever go back to that. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.